Nor are we live right now.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Archives of American Arts Unboxed Lunch. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this is being recorded. I also want to gratefully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the indigenous territory of the Piscataway and the Kashtok peoples, as well as recognize the diverse native communities who make their home here today. My name is Nora, and today I'm joining you from the Shaw neighborhood of Washington, DC. We're thrilled you're joining us. Our national collector, Josh Franco, is coming to us from our office in the Victor Building in downtown Washington. Today's event is all about Texas arts nonprofit, Women and Their Work, which Josh will be exploring with all of you in just a few minutes. We're very excited to have Women and Their Works gallery director, Rachel Stuckey, and executive director, Chris Cowden, on the uh, call with us today. So if you two want to chime in wherever, that would be delightful. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a co couple of housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions for Josh, which I will read to him as he uncovers materials from the collection. To submit a question, just type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Also, closed captioning is available. You can access captions by clicking the CC button on the bottom right side of the control panel on your screen. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Josh Franco, National Collector at the Archives of American Art. Hi, Josh. Hi, Nora. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and yeah, nice to see everyone. I already see some chats to me. That's great. I'll uh, get to you all. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really happy today, uh, not only in the kind of general way, I'm always excited about a new research rich collection, but particularly this one, Women and Their Work, is a Texas based organization dedicated to art by women and feminist art since its founding in the mid 1970s. Um, I'm a Texan and I went to college just a little bit up the road from Women and Their Work. And uh, it's held a special place in my kind of art journey for a long time. So there's some personal meaning here as well, which is um, really nice. Um, some background on this collection before we get into some documents. Uh, so women and their work, uh, you know, the archives besides uh, collecting individual artist papers and other individuals, um, we also do collect the records of arts organizations. Uh, typically, we don't collect them if they're still operating, um, unless uh, there's a very specific uh, reason, which means a really kind of significant institutional moment to do so. So that's sort of baked, that not sort of, it is baked into our collections plan document, uh, which is our curatorial guide here. Um, the moment in this case is women and their work, uh, as many of you I'm sure know, recently moved into their new building, uh, which is the first big physical move since. Um, being in the, their original spot uh, in downtown Austin since the 70s. Um, that place has a lot of fond memories for me, uh, both as places I went to and then as I got older and my friends did as well, seeing friends show their work there. Um, so it's just always held a, a special place and this is just really exciting. You could tell I'm a little like extra nervous and excited about this one. Uh, I just want to do the Texans proud. Um, and I'll just point out behind me on my wall are always these two Kathy Vargas photographs who's an, a great Texas-based uh, Texas artist um, who's uh, done work with women and their work as well in the past. So it's always kind of here. I don't know if Kathy's on the call, if you are, hi Kathy. Um, so what we've got in the collection is about approximately 18 linear feet. A linear foot is one banker's box. Um, you know, COVID impacted this collection as well. There was an urgency to move the papers because of moving the building. Um, but we were grounded. Normally in my job, I travel quite a bit to, to review papers on site, especially large collections like this. That wasn't possible in November, December when we started this conversation. So um, the intrepid Rachel Stuckey, the gallery director, uh, who's kind of our contact on the ground there, um, we coordinated and did a, a kind of on-site review over FaceTime. So Rachel was in storage at Women and Their Work, and I we looked closely at uh, the mini boxes and sort of did this the our typical review process, but virtually to whittle down what made sense to come to the archives, and um, it was successful, and that's what we ended up with. The papers shipped in January, and um, yeah, they've been here since. So they just await their minimal level processing and finding aid, which will happen within a year or so. 
Um, okay, so let's dive in. So I think it just seems you know appropriate to start with the very first uh, documents of the institution. So box one, folders one and two, the label is the Women in Their Work Festival of the Arts, October, December, 1977. And immediately you're hit with some good vintage graphics and fonts. This is a flyer um, that folds out. And I'll say the bulk of the material in this collection uh, is related to grants and funding. So it's a great how-to for anyone uh, who kind of wants cues or inspiration to how to run a nonprofit. I think Women in Their Work is a great success story. Um, but what I'm going to show you today is uh, the stuff that's a little more visually interesting because we're on we're doing a screen-based sort of fun thing here. Uh, but please know that the, the real heart of the research to be done here is, um, yeah, definitely in how to how to build and run a nonprofit, uh, as well as of course women's history and feminist art history. So one Good of the question, kind of, Josh. Sure. Uh, is that Catherine Dunham? In this picture? Yes, I think that is what uh, it is. says. Uh, well, which let me see. The photos are by a few people. Here are the names I see Elizabeth Ney, Nsozake Shange, Gina Lolly. Mm. Uh, yep, so no, I don't believe so, unless there's a miscaption. But that's, that's a great kind of uh, thing a researcher would figure out and mm. confirm or um, correct. But I imagine those are the right names. So I wanted to read just the opening paragraph from the Women in Their Work Symposium. So one of the initial events, one of the initial forms of Women in Their Work was this event. Uh, this will give you a sense of the important work the founders were doing. Uh, the symposium series, Women, Art, and Society, will explore arts-related public policy issues and their effects on society and culture in general. Questions will be raised, such as, should state and local governments adopt affirmative action policies regarding cultural institutions. Two, what are the rights of women artists as taxpayers to receive an equitable segment of public funds? And three, what are the responsibilities of state and locally funded cultural institutions to provide services, programs, and exhibitions of particular interest to women, either as a targeted audience or as participants? So kind of right out the gate, uh, hit and heavy, asking the big questions. And then after that, in this, there's you know, letters requesting funding, there's budget documents, uh, more kind of public flyers listing objectives and defining the organization. So yeah, that's where, <laughs> this is sort of the folder where it all got started. Um, I think, and yeah, Chris, Rachel, if you have any more info on that, please um, put in. And then on the other end, so that's the kind of stuff that uh, proposed funding to get things off the ground. And then the second folder, Festival of the Arts 1977 Evaluation Report. So this is after the event. Um, you have income reporting on these budgets and handwriting and just more documentation supporting, um, you know, marking it as a successful event and reporting out to funders. So those are great. And again, just there's a plethora of that and it's, um, worth visiting for sure. Um, and I think it's just important to mind to keep in mind too, you know, this is all taking place in Texas. I think um, you know, there, there's a whole network of uh, art spaces dedicated to women's work like AIR in New York City, uh, from which we have a lot of material in the collection, uh, women's space in LA. So it's really good to see it sort of, um, you know, happening in Texas and now have it represented in the archives. Uh, we have a list, Nora, I don't know if you have it handy to put in the chat, but just to name some of the other women's organizations, uh, Women's Caucus for Arts, these are records we have in the archives, Women's Caucus for the Arts, Sound Recordings, that's Bay Area, Midwest Women's Artist Conference, uh, which is the Midwest, Women Artists in Revolution, a New York organization from the 70s, Women's Art Regist Registry of Minnesota, uh, and that's just a few, there's like 10 more just on this list I have handy. Um, all right, photographs, because those are fun to look at. So this is a folder from, I believe, it says contact sheets and negatives in general. I saw something in here earlier that pointed to the year 19, yeah, 1982. Um, so here's the photograph. On the back, there's some annotation that reads, uh, radiation risk reception area, June 1982. I think Alan Pogue is the photographer. 
And this was clearly a photograph uh, that was being used for some kind of publication because you see notes about dimension, though they're very faded, but notes about dimensions uh, and positioning and how to crop it um, for something. We love these kind of shots here. You know, it's great to see art in its exhibition environment. Obviously, most exhibitions are temporary. Um, so these are the way that those memories live and how researchers can get a sense of not only the art, but who was at the show and um, you know, what the art was and how it was positioned in relation to other art. And then there's just some great shots of individual artworks. So this is State Fair canceled from that radiation risk show. It does not list uh, an artist name there. And this is called Full Responsibility by Bonnie O'Neill, Mixed Media Assemblage. Uh, Josh, we have a couple of questions about other um, collections um, from Texas or um, the South or what that looks like in our archives. Yeah, um, there we have, we did a, the archives before my time here, but there was a Texas focused initiative that uh, a lot of the result of that was um, oral histories actually. So uh, there's a number of those, Carrie Cordova is a great art historian, conducted a lot of those oral histories. I myself have collected the papers of um, Kathy Vargas, Jesse Amado, both in San Antonio, um, there are some others in the works from Texas. Uh, yeah, Pepe Coronado, who's a recent, he's a New York and Texas person, a printmaker, um, who recently really moved his base to Austin from New York. So yeah, there's a lot of Texas represented in the archives. That's great. In no small part from you. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little bit me, yeah, but you know, people and, um, doing stuff before, yeah. Kay just chimed in, Kay Turner um, just typed, chimed in in the chat and said that she was in that show. And oh, she made a great. piece with Rita Star Pattern, the co-founder of Women and Their Work. Thanks. That's Kay. amazing. And I'll say Kay Turner too, another great Texan and New Yorker, um, I think is who connected us initially to, to explore this idea of the records coming to the archives. Um, and I'm glad it worked out. Uh, Kay's, we've collaborated in a few ways, Kay, at the archives, as you know. Um, here's a contact sheet, so I don't know if, I don't see K, but there's some small, you know, you need a, a little loop, a magnifying glass to look at a researcher. An intrepid researcher might spend time identifying every single person and work of art um, visible in this sheet. I don't know if anyone recognizes this woman here. Yeah, and that is the... Well, it says subject Lockhart, November, 1982. Um, okay, I have some other big stuff to show you, but there's some great contact sheets here with more documentation. Uh, women and their work, I think it's important to point out, um, we're a repository dedicated to visual arts. Women and their work uh, is much broader in its scope of what it presented. Um, not that we separated out those records or anything. So the records also contain um, documentation of musicians uh, and dancers and theater artists as well. And here is a photo labeled Benefit, December 1982. So this is a good old fundraiser party. Um, so many of which, including ours, have been canceled due to pandemic in the last year. Uh, so there's something really heartwarming about seeing these party scenes right now. And hopefully we'll all be back to this kind of thing soon. I hear you. Could you hold it a little, just a little closer, Josh? Yeah. Yeah. Should focus. Hmm. Okay, so the uh, one of the other things, so, you know, these are expected things in here and they're great. One of the surprising discoveries, uh, kind of fields of research that I think are made really possible and rich by this collection is in graphic design and the history of. Um, so this is something I would love to know more about. Uh, I hope a researcher kind of picks up this thread. Um, it appears that women in their work put a lot of time and energy and effort and resources into graphic design of posters for shows, of announcements, of pamphlets. And because they were doing this, you know, before the 
computers were in wide use um, before everything, all of this that's now done you know, in Acrobat and Adobe Suite, um, it's all done by hand. So there's this kind of all tons of this amazing material with a lot of onion skin paper, hand drawing, hand drafting of um, visual layouts, text, uh, color fields marked. So this one, the label here is Women in Their Work Quarterly, uh, October 1983. It tells you the ink types, PMS 293 plus black, quantity 1,000. This is the centerfold. Uh, yeah, so just in a, I, there's something really, <laughs> I think, novel about seeing this all done by hand uh, in the year 2021. And there's a ton, so here's this. Now you can't do that anymore. That's kind of amazing. So the question mm -hmm. about um, digitization, um, when this collection might be available digitally. Yeah, so uh, when we acquire a collection, we commit to minimal level processing and a finding aid, but digitization is not automatic for any new collection. Um, but what's great is once there is a finding aid, uh, it's, a, it's eligible for digitization on demand. Um, and that means anyone in the world can go to the finding aid, which is online, identify down to a single folder what they want digitized. Um, and each folder is a, a small fee of $37.50 for the <laughs> labor of the digitizers. Um, and, and once somebody does that, they get the high-res files delivered to them personally, but they also go online. So it's a really great service to the field. Um, the other way digitization happens is through kind of large funding. So we have long-term partnerships with Terra Foundation, Lichtenstein Foundation, um, and Nora, you would know these better than I do. Uh, but through the Latino Center here at the Smithsonian uh, has sponsored a lot of the uh, digitization, whole collection digitization. So it's something we do very actively, but it's not something that's automatic. Um, and, you know, please look out for the finding aid in a year or so for this and sponsor a folder. I kind of call it a sponsor a folder program. And if you're interested in sponsoring many folders, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all of the folders, yeah. you can also uh, get in touch with us uh, as well. But the digitization on demand especially has been a godsend during the pandemic as well. So keep an eye out for the finding aid. And if you have more questions about how digitization works, you can always reach out to us too. Yeah, yeah, no one was in an ideal place, but I think we were in an advantageous place mm -hmm. when the pandemic hit because we've been digitizing um, earnestly for so long. Um, you know, everyone don't forget there are these kinds of things in archives and we collect these and it's good that this one's labeled. It's not extensive, but it's helpful to have some information, Maryland's Paintathon. Um, and eventually during processing, this will go to the digital uh, archiving team and they have a lot of digital forensic equipment. If you ever come to our office, it's a fun corner of the office to check out. Um, there's vintage Macs and weird, other weird stuff that I don't understand, but they do, but they can access uh, antiquated technology like this to see what's on it. Um, I imagine this is more graphic design, but we would have to get into it to see. Uh, here's just another great one. But here we have the company, I guess this is a contractor firm used, Tokeny Design. And yeah, just beautiful material, color samples, hand colored mock-ups, notes for production. Yeah, just very, very, very nice stuff. Um, and then here's some, so women in their work uh, has just, I mean, I think the network of artists that it's supported is massive and sprawling and covers kind of all levels um, of the art world. Uh, from very local Texas artists to nationally, internationally known folks. Here's a mock-up for an Adrian Piper, uh, maybe a mailer. It looks like a mailer. It looks like there's a place for postage here. And this is actually three different panels, four different panels. So Adrian Piper, of course, now is a worldwide known amazing artist. Uh, this is her activity documented at women and their work in Texas. Uh, I'll just read you a note from this one here. There are two concepts working here, one being the Piper, the other comes across in the colors of black, white, and the gray area in between, uh, representing the artist's two influences. 
So this raises questions that, you know, was this done in collaboration with the artist? Uh, a researcher would dig in, maybe reach out to, <laughs> to women in their work uh, to find out more. Uh, yeah, great. Okay, I'm not gonna get too distracted myself from that. This is a um, good question, a pretty um, particular question, but it would be cool if it's, um, could figure it out. Uh, is there, uh, have records from women in their works showing of autobiography in her own image among the papers? Have you seen any of that, Josh? Uh, that doesn't ring a bell for me, but I, you know, no one person can hold an entire collection in their head. And like I said, it's about 17, 18 boxes like this. Um, once there's a finding aid, that's probably something that would be listed at the top level um, of that. Uh, a lot of it is organized in artists and project files. So once our, you know, our great, fantastic processing archivists get their hands on it, um, that will be a very easy question to answer. So again, Unboxed is all about the, you know, almost raw uh, new collections. So that's the, the downside. But all these questions are great to know. Uh, this is my, I want to make one of these for myself. The great Coco Flusco. This is a, a mock-up for a mailer. Uh, here's the final result. Coco Flusco is coming. And that's all you need to know, right? Oh, Chris just said it is there. So there you go. Uh, and here's the back. So again, another now, you know, internationally famous artist um, working, I think this is 1994. Uh, this is after her collaboration with Guillermo Gomez Peña that is a sort of touch point for performance art and decolonial art now. Um, and that's what she was coming to speak about specifically. Um, and that was, that event was a collaboration between women and their work and the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center, which is a uh, major presence in Austin, of course, for, um, the humanities and intellectual life. And then there's always just the business. That's what these records are really important for is just, you know, here's an invoice from the graphic arts company that produced these. And one more example of uh, more mock -up. So this is, again, another way. I think, you know, people who are alive now are, have never seen this kind of design, this kind of method of manual design. Um, so I think it's an important, these are just important design artifacts to have. Let me see what this one was. About. Oh, it's all in reverse, but this is Hillary Easton and Company. Looks like dance. Yeah. Are there any more questions, Nora? I'm going to keep digging through this pile here. There aren't. Um, Here's but, the question. Uh, oh, that's great. Yeah. There is an, an idea of, um, you know, if when the photos are digitized, it would be great to crowdsource identification of artists and art and exhibitions. Are there yeah. times we've done that sort of before? Well, that, so that just raises two things. One, um, we, not all the time, but definitely uh, occasionally, one of us on staff, people just find the email they find, uh, will reach out to let us know. I see this um, photograph on your website. It says unidentified and they'll know who that is. Uh, so then, you know, we'll do a little work to verify that. Usually we trust our source too, or, you know, they tell us who they are. Uh, and then we go ahead and make that change. And it's really easy to, um, it's really appreciated actually. It makes our, our resources much more valuable to have names and things. So if you ever are on our website and see somebody you know and they're listed as unidentified, let us know and um, we'll make that change. But the other, so that's not super systematic. It just happens when it happens, but the Transcription Center I think is um, sort of related. So the Smithsonian Transcription Center uh, is a service we use heavily at the archives and that, uh, that applies to like, you know, text. So we, you know, we have a lot of correspondence in our collections, um, volunteers all over the world. Uh, we put them in the transcription center and then volunteers all over the world um, make typewritten manuscripts out of them. So it's in, you know, it's in all languages because again, it's a global audience of volunteers um, and it's people who really like the minutia of trying to under read handwriting, <laughs> sometimes handwriting that's wild because it's wild or handwriting that's a little different because it's cursive from the 1920s. Um, 
but uh, so I really appreciate them. And um, I, I, I would imagine we're one of the heavier users of the transcription center among Smithsonian units. I uh, think so. Yeah. And I think when the um, pandemic started happening, I can't speak to the trends now, but when it started, it was a very popular activity for, yeah. yeah. I remember oh, yeah. hearing like the use went up like 500%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows where it is now? <laughs> so that is very systematic. And actually, I just, right. the meeting I had before this was about selecting some materials to send through there. Yeah. Here's a question uh, Will this material be tagged and cross referenced across the remainder of your collection? So that's uh, cross referencing is what happens when you search. And once the finding aid is online, um, if you type, you know, Coco Fusco, if she's listed in the finding aid as a file. Um, and if you type Coco Fusco's name into the website, you'll see everywhere she appears in our collection, whether that's in oral histories or listed in finding aids for other collections. Um, so yeah, the, you know, the internet makes cross-referencing possible. And are there other materials besides, you showed the floppy, are there, are there other materials besides that floppy and uh, the papers that came in? Yeah, I think there's a little more AV, and this is something I meant to go dig more for, but I, I think there might be some cassette tapes, if I remember. Um, there's probably more floppies. And uh, yeah, but we, what you know, what have we collected? And just generally, we've collected thumb drives, uh, CDs, DVDs, uh, beta, all the, all the weird formats, for sure. And then good old, you know, magnetic strip tape um, as part of it, yeah collections so we have it's weird I guess they're like actually diagonal from each other in the office it's digital archiving over here and then there's an AV lab over in this corner um, so we I think I think we do a good job managing that stuff and if you have we also um, did an unbox lunch a couple of months ago about an entirely digital yeah. collection the um, Hammersley Foundation records if you're interested in seeing that, I can send you the recording, but that was very informative in terms of going forward, what our collecting might look like and our preservation. Um, that's also called born digital material. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, we're, yeah, so, you know, with women and their work, that'll be, an, you know, I'm sure all the records since, you know, the 90s, late 90s, 2000s are being created on computers. So in Word documents and Excel that have never been, they've never been analog paper. And um, if, you know, this collection is uh, we're we've you know we're committed to the period before the big move to the new building, um, so it's primarily analog and paper uh, stuff. But then, and, you know, when a collector in the future considers um, whatever women in the work might generate now, till for the next 100, 200 years, you're going to be around forever. Um, I'm sure they're going to have to you know really deal with the born digital material that I'm sure everything is created as now. And we will be super ready for all of those <laughs> all of those materials well thank you so much josh and thanks everyone for joining us for this um unboxed lunch we hope to see you next time as well um i want to tell you that support from friends like you makes it possible for us to share collections like the women in their work records with people all across the world and if you're interested in your gift being recognized during Unbox Lunch, please contact me, Nora Daniels, at danielsn at si.edu. My contact information is also in the chat. My colleague placed it there. And to support the work of our collector, the collectors and archivists, you can always visit our support webpage at aaa.si.edu slash support. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy summer. Um, be well and see you next time. Bye, y'all.